Good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us tonight. My name is Dr. Bill Tulo, I'm medical director here at Oculus, and welcome to tonight's clinical webcast called The Business of Dry Eye. There's a text box on your GoToWebinar screen where you can enter questions. Uh, please enter questions throughout the webinar, and we have saved time at the end to answer as many as we can. If for any reason we can't get to your question, we will answer them via email after the webinar is concluded. Our speakers tonight are Dr. Jim Owen and Dr. Tom Wyshewski. Dr. Owen sees secondary dry eye patients within Gordon Shanslin New Vision Institute. This practice is a multi-specialty referral center for cataracts and laser vision correction surgery. Prior to that, he was director of clinical services for TLC Laser Eye Centers and is the past president of the Optometric Council on Refractive Therapy. Dr. Owens, a member of the American Optometric Association and a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry. Dr. Wyshewski sees dry eye patients and specialty contact lens cases as his practice Carolina Forest Eye Care in Myrtle Beach. Dr. Wyshewski has specialized in contact lenses for over three decades. He earned his fellowship from the International Academy of Orthokeratology in 2009 and served on the board of directors for the American Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control from 2009 to 2019. Over the last few years, Dr. Wyshewski has made treating dry eye a cornerstone of his private practice. And I'm looking forward to learning from both of you our approaches to dry eye tonight and how it's influenced how you practice. So without further ado, um, Jim, why don't you start off giving us a little bit more detail about the practice that you're doing dry eye in? So I'm really fortunate to be at Gordon Chanson New Vision Institute. Um, it started out as just a laser center. We're in the building to the left up on the eighth floor, so we really don't get any walk-in traffic and Kind of with COVID, people are having to call down from the lobby to get buzzed up to the elevator. Um, but it's certainly a secondary care practice. And so we've expanded out to add, you know, not only a plastic surgeon and a cornea surgeon and we do cataracts, but it's it's secondary care. And so the, the patients I see kind of fall into more of that bucket than uh, a private practice optometry practice. Tom, tell us a little bit about Carolina Forest Family Eye Care. Sure, Bill. Um, after practicing in New Jersey for 19 years, I uh, decided to invest everything I could into real estate in South Carolina. We moved down um, with the thought of semi-retirement, and within a month, I was climbing the walls. I decided I'm going to open up a practice, and it's going to be small. I'm not going to make anything big, and um, but I need to get back into it because I love what I do. And um, good thing I did because then that was in 05 and 08 came along and I, you can just imagine what happened to my real estate investment ventures. Um, if it wasn't for, um, for opening the practice, I might be living in a refrigerator box underneath an overpass somewhere. Um, but we opened the practice, started small, 1,500 square feet, and it grew rapidly. Uh, Myrtle Beach is an ex it is the fastest growing metro area in the United States. Um, it was for a while and then the crash came and that all stopped, but now it's a retirement community. And even though I've specialized in ortho K and myopia control and specialty lenses for years, realized that two years ago, um, I was gonna have to do something different. And that's when I got serious with dry eye and um, it has been a total game changer for me. And so we'll talk about that tonight. Jim, let's just discuss the, the diagnostic and therapeutic equipment that you utilize on a daily basis. So use a whole host of things. Um, it starts with, uh, with questionnaires. We use both an OSDI and a speed questionnaire. Um, we use the keratograph um, for its biography. Mostly we look also we'll look at um, the tear breakup time and look at the tear layer a little bit. Um, obviously, at the slit lamp, using fluorescein, using the cinnamon green, um, doing anterior segment imaging. Um, we'll do a little bit of zone quick. Interestingly enough, we um, in a study where we need to do esthesiometry to qualify for the study, and I've actually found it to be helpful with a bunch of patients. Um, I'm surprised decrease in corneal sensitivity that exists out there and the asymmetric decrease in corneal sensitivity that exists. Um, 
I'm a huge proponent of looking at my bulimian glands. Um, so whether you image them or, or express them, um, you can use the the core of my, of my bulimian gland expressor. I found my index finger works best because I want to sometimes see how hard do I have to push to get anything to come out or to get anything, you know, if anything does come out. Um, therapeutically, you know, obviously we use a bunch of different drops. Um, we use Blefex, we'll use Procara and my treatment of choice has been Ilux. Great, Jim. Um, in contrast, I, I chose the both of you uh, to speak tonight because uh, amongst a lot of people I know that have very successful dry practices, I think the two of you have very unique models that I think are applicable to a lot of our audience tonight. One being a private practice OD setting, one in a uh, in a cataract refractive surgery ophthalmology setting. Um, and I, it's it's interesting to me how many things you guys do similar, but also how many things you kind of do differently, which is characteristic of typical dry eye practices where there's so many different ways to slice the apple with dry eye. Tom, why don't you talk a little bit about your approach diagnostically and therapeutically? Sure, Bill. So diagnostically, I have to say the Keratograph 5M has been the cornerstone of our dry eye program. And uh, we use it on every single comprehensive exam as part of a screening. And we only do four images. We'll do um, a lipid layer. We'll look at tear meniscus height. We'll do a redness score. And we do mybography on the lower lids. And typically, it's going to be my associate doing that. And from that, we can gather whether or not there's an issue and whether or not this patient needs to return for full dry eye workup. Uh, we use the OSDI questionnaire. I don't think it's anything better than speed or, or DEQ5, but it's just, it's an old habit and I, that's what I still use. We use, we use a slit lamp and all, of course all the uh, vital dyes. We do a lot of anterior seg imaging and one thing I didn't put in there diagnostically is that core of my Bulmian gland evaluator. I really like that. And um, so we use that on all our dry eye evaluations. Therapeutically, you can see that I like my toys. I have just about every platform out there except what Jim has. I don't have Ilux and I don't have MyBoFlow. But we, I'd have to say at this point in time, the two biggest guns I have there are the Luminous M22 uh, IPL, and um, I've really gotten to like the Marco Equinox, Equinox LLLT. Lipoflow is something we don't do quite as much of anymore. The newest toy, uh, which I, I've only used on me and my staff so far, because we've only just recently got certified in it, was Tempshore Envy. That's radio frequency. Um, we do tear care, not as much now that they're looking to get insurance coverage for it, do Blefex, a lot of Blefex, and we do a fair amount of Procara as well. So Tom, I, I wanted you to talk a little bit about, I know how you use the Keratograph and you use it as a basic screening tool to, to find your dry patients, but talk a little bit about just how you use it, how you build, how you build patients for it, and the difference between out-of-pocket and insurance billing. Sure. So. If the doctor has only the keratograph and doesn't want to purchase something like IPL because of the, the expense, um, or they don't want to pay for, for Ilux or Lipoflow, just using the keratograph, that's it, just this one device, this is what we, when we bring a patient back for a complete dry eye workup, we'll do a crystal tear report, which is a series of images. We typically do about nine images on a patient. Um, the, the fees that we collect are, it's just an office visit, a level four office visit. Uh, if you want to do osmolarity or inflammadry, I don't typically do those. Uh, I don't have um, the uh, tear lab here. Um, I don't really know that I would find that I would change much about how I would handle the patients. It would just be a nice measurement, I guess. Uh, we do a lot of external photos. We do an, a $99 out-of-pocket um, expense for the patients for doing the crystal tear report on the keratograph uh, if there is any diagnostic reason to use topography you can bill for that as well 
So you can bill up to $350 just billing their medical insurance. Well, $99 it will be there out of pocket. And typically what I'm gonna recommend is going to be a heat mask. Uh, I'm a huge proponent of omega-3s. We use PRN. Um, I like doing lid scrubs and I like using hypochlorous spray, spray. Sometimes if it's indicated, we'll also do a sleep mask. So, I mean, you can see just from looking at this, you're gonna be collecting around $700, even if you didn't offer any advanced treatments. Um, so that's just from you know, the potential profit you can derive from owning the Keratograph. Jim, t tell us where you get your patients from in your, in your tertiary care practice. Wh where do the patients come from? So they come from a handful of places, the pre and post LASIK patients. So like I said, this laser center has been around for over 20 something odd years. Nikki Gordon, kind of one of the original LASIK surgeons in America. Um, but as you know all too well, um, treating patients that already have dry eye with either laser vision correction or cataract surgery just creates a problem. You know, if you take care of the problem before surgery, it's their problem. If you if it have to wait after surgery, it becomes the surgery's problem. Um, the practice, like I said, has grown a bit where um, we get some internal referrals from cornea patients or some glaucoma patients. Um, the laser business was built on optometric referrals. And it's always curious to me that the more we educate our OD network on how to take care of things and kind of the, you know, what, what Tom just said there is like, you don't have to really buy anything expensive to do a lot. We, the more we educate, the more referrals we get. Um, but I think the more that they do, so I think it's a good relationship. And internet searches, I bet you a, a patient a day comes from, I've had these dry eye problems and you're the only ones that do dry eye. It's like, oh, I think there's more than us, but that's okay. And I, I cut out, this is the button, I guess, on our homepage, our landing page of what it says. And so it's nothing special. But I mean, there's one of those that looks like laser vision correction, the ones that looks like cataract surgery. So, you know, they have a few options. It's pretty clean. Um, so the internet continues to be a bigger and bigger source for our patients. And Tom, I know you have similar uh, referrals, probably different percentages. Uh, where, where do most of your patients come from? Do you mine your own patients, your primary yeah. care patients, or where do they come from? The, the vast majority come from within my own practice. So, you know, when we started the dry eye practice, it really, we didn't add any new patients, or not very many, I would say. These are patients that are already in the chair. They're already patients who have an issue that we've never really addressed before. The one thing I didn't mention is my community has become a retirement community. So everyone who lives here is a transplant from the Northeast, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and maybe some Maryland. But that accounts for about 80 to 90% of the population here in my immediate uh, community. And I, if I had to pick an average age, I'd say my average demographically would be a 64-year-old Caucasian female. So they all have dry eye. And you know, by offering OrthoK -okay myopia control services to them, I was really not doing myself any favors. Um, these people are already in the chair and I wasn't doing anything about it. That's when I, when I realized that, that's when I decided to get serious about it. We, so Tom, a, a question about how you get those patients to reveal their symptoms. I know in my practice, before I started doing questionnaires and doing screenings with the keratograph, a lot of these patients would come in, they wouldn't even mention the problem, um, and it would get lost. And until I started looking for the patients and mining the patients, I, I was amazed at how many were there and how many people started talking about the problem they already had, where they didn't really reveal it in a, in a routine registration form. What's your experience been? My experience mirrors yours exactly. And it's, it's true. I mean, as we get older, we just assume naturally that these are just normal consequences of aging, when in fact they're not. And so you don't even think to mention it because maybe you mentioned it 10 times over the course of your life and 10 times a doctor reached up onto a shelf and grabbed a, a bottle of artificial tears and handed it to you and it didn't really help. And they figure you're not going to do anything more than that. So we screen everyone. We do, as part of our normal pretest procedure, every comprehensive exam, for every adult anyhow, um, we do a series of four uh, images on the keratograph. 
as I mentioned before, we do a lid meniscus height, we do a um, lipid layer view, we do a redness score, and we do mybography on the lower lids because it's quick and easy. It takes my techs about three minutes extra to put the, peop the, the data into um, the keratograph and then grab those scans. It takes my associate or I another two to maybe three minutes to run through them. So does it add to my exam time? Yeah. But in terms of the re reward, the return on that time spent is just tremendous. You know, Jim touched on, you know, patients who are pre-surgical or post-surgical. Since we have so many seniors in our practice, we make a lot of cataract referrals. And I know my cataract surgeons love having nice tear films to work with, and it improves their results. Uh, so we do get that. We do get some referrals from other practices around here, even from some of the ophthalmology practices. And the internet has become big. I, I've actually, we, our website has quite a bit of information about dry eye. And um, that really has helped us find those patients who have been suffering for a long time. We've had patients come from as far away as four hours just because they've read information on our website that they didn't see on anybody else's. So, Tom, just one clarification, because I've seen you do this live, and I think there's something that you should probably reiterate and clarify because it's impressive to me is when you review these images with the patients, I think the impact of having this technology in your exam lane to review with the patients, I think that's really important. Can you just mention uh, verbally how you do that? Sure. So my, my text as part of the pre-screening will capture their images and chair side. I've got a 32 inch flat screen TV and I'm pulling up these images. And, you know, if I show someone their mybography or their redness score, women especially, you show them a redness score and they're horrified when they see how red their eyes actually are. Um, it, it's really people ask me, well, how do you sell this? I don't sell anything. I educate my patients about, and I show them things that they've never seen before. And we take this for granted because this is what we do, but these patients have never seen this. And when you can connect the dots for them, show them, well, look, you have plenty of water in your eyes. Tear meniscus height is perfectly normal, but you don't have any oil in your tear film. And these are the glands that produce the oil. And you can see that they're all withered away. And we show them a comparison to a normal and you can see how red your eyes are that's inflammation they get it i mean you have to show it's show and tell it's just like being in kindergarten again yeah i was very impressed that they, with the 30 inch tv and how obvious some subtle things became when you're showing it it was very impressive to me i went home and immediately upgraded my tvs <laughs> So I want to talk about the first patient. Jim, I think this is a patient of yours. I, I thought tonight that the best way we can get our, our points across about the business of dry eye is to actually take some real patients and, and show what you guys do in every day and how you do it. Um, so, Jim, why don't you take off with patient number one? Sure. No, thanks, Bill. Um, a patient, as I was talking about, referred by the Internet. Um, I see you do dry eye stuff. and. All my doctors, no one's been able to take care of me. And it's 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 always a tricky question of like what has worked, what has failed. And because I'll say, oh, nothing works. And like, what does nothing mean? It's like, well, visine one and visine eight didn't work. And or sometimes people have tried, you know, zyderacesis sequa, all of the above. So she could see well. Um, what was remarkable about her osmolarity score significantly high. Um, you know, eyes were a little bit red, speed score really high. Um, I don't think of the maximum speed score is 24. Uh, when it gets above six, they start getting interesting. Um, as Tom pointed out, showing patients their mybography is just huge. Um, and so, you know, seeing a significant gland loss and then being able to show her, um, and when I push on the glands, I just don't get a whole lot coming out. Um, you know, there wasn't a lot of injection, there wasn't a lot of staining, um, but the, the, the high osmolarity score was kind of one of those, hmm, what, what's what's that all about? And so kind of flip the next one. So it's, you know, it, it, it's interesting. It's like, I'll tell patients, we can do a treatment now or we can you know do a bunch of things and, and come back. And, but part of with her was because you're so inflamed with that osmolarity score, um, I'm biased to do it now. So we basically did right and left, upper and lower lids, 
So two zones on ILUX maybe takes 10 minutes, you know, two zones lower, one zone upper. Um, but I put on her low to max for a week. Um, and then Jim, on the ILUX, Jim, do you do that yourself or does your tech do it? The way it's set up here, I do it. Okay. I do it. Yeah. So the dry eye clinic in this practice was an add on. And it, and it's, um, when he said, I have the, the keratograph in the exam lane, it's like, Oh, I literally have it in the exam lane because in our pretest area, because Dr. Gordon's been involved in every study you can imagine with laser vision correct, we have more more diagnostic toys you can you can ever think of. Um, and so there was no place for it but in my little exam lane. So it sits in the exam lane with me and I do it and I'm kind of a one man show to some of this extent. But in in training other people or other practices, uh, technicians can do it. It really depends on your your practice is set up um but yeah similar i will always you know hand them the the heat mask and the, the hydro eye um and say you gotta promise you're gonna do this the analogy we give is like all right we did a teeth cleaning just now you need to brush your teeth and floss and so you've got to do something along with this to to help with the process um i've become biased by hydro eye because I live in Southern California, you're required to do yoga, you're required to be on fish oil and omega-3s. And so I've had lots of patients on omega-3s with still problems. We have added hydro eye and, and seen remarkable results. So um, I, I, it seems to be targeted more specifically toward those glands. The GLA, I think, is, is significant for it. But that's kind of a, my basic treatment. In general, after ILUX, I don't prescribe Lotomax, but because she was pretty inflamed that we added the Lodomax. We can go to the next one. And so, you know, results that you would just love to see, you know, speed score down to six, osmolarity is not perfect, but certainly in a much more normal range, you have um, much greater expression of meibomian glands and the quality of the meibom was much better. So mostly clear, a lot more glands, no staining, these are breakup time, no injection, happy patient. And so kind of, very simple, very straightforward, but you know, having a diagnostic of the osmolarity kind of threw up a red flag and having the ability to just do it when they come in. Um, I think you can always have these patients back. And now will you, after this follow-up and they're doing so well, when do you see them again? Do you see them in an annual exam? Or do you see them before that? No. So, so, and I don't know if Thomas found this out with, with, with Lipoflow, but I'm sure he, he has like the number one question is like, how often do I need to do this? And the data out there is a little bit mixed and there's not a great answer, right? And so I tell people that's like, you know, this technology is relatively new. Um, we don't know how long it, you need it done. There's a study that shows it should last for at least a year. Um, after I see him at six weeks, I see him at six months. And so we'll repeat all of these kind of tests um, like the initial one, except for my biography. And I'll say more than likely you should look decent at six months and still feel good. I'll see you in six months after that, one for your annual exam, but be prepared that we might want to repeat this once a year. If I had to get out on a limb, if someone's a contact lens wearer, I think once a year is probably about right. I have some really recalcitrant, difficult patients that we've done ILUX every four months, but they're the exception. And I've got 20 something year old females that they've gone two years and they still look pretty good. So. Quickie back of the math um, breakdown of kind of there's an office visit built into that. There's a treatment for the ILUX, the the mask, the hydro eye, and just under a thousand dollars later, thirty minutes of my time ish. Good, nice summary, Jim. Thanks, Tom. I have your first patient up. Sure. So it's a 78 year old white female. Her eyes are gritty, vision is fluctuating. She's not a happy camper. The wind just drives her nuts. Her OSDI score was 25. Her nick butt was four, just over four seconds and no visible lipid layer on, um, on the keratograph. So this would be, this, that was her screen of all the, the, the uh, images I caught during the dry eye workup. Again, we had already screened her and that's how she ended up coming in. So here you can see, you know, the lipid layer, we expect to see some iridescence, like a, like a rainbow effect, and there is none there. 
you, if you look carefully, you can see she's got some ocular rosacea and blepharitis. And, you know, I don't know if you've noticed this, Jim, and I, I'm going to ask you before we're done, but if you look carefully along the lid margin, not, I'm sorry, the, the lash line, you see that whitish discoloration. Um, Jim Reinerson uh, wrote the paper on Deb's dry eye blepharitis syndrome. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. But he showed micro, uh, micro um, electron photographs of epithelial cells along that margin, and it, it mirrors this perfectly. I mean, what we typically have been trained to call blepharitis is kind of end-stage blepharitis. It's flagrant flaking and collarettes and just nasty-looking lids. But that's not how it starts. It starts out pretty simply, and it starts out maybe it's just this greasy sheen along the lid margin. But when you realize that it's bacterial overload just collecting, and that ends up getting down into the, those meibomian glands is what really leads us down to meibomian gland dysfunction. Of course, there's a lot more to dry eye than simply that, but if, they, if these are seniors, they all have blepharitis, and they all have meibomian gland dysfunction. So this is just looking at my biography of the lower lid in the center there. You can see a, a gland that has dropped out. The rest of them are a little bit dysmorphic, and I don't know if there's a name for this, but if you look carefully at each one of those glands, if you look straight down the center, right where the, the um, main duct for that gland would be, you'll see a dark stripe. Yeah, right there. And to me, that's a dead giveaway that there is nothing coming out of these glands. They are completely inspissated and they're starting to die off. Now, typically we think of glands as dying from in the lower lid from the top down, but if you look carefully at this one, you'll see they're pulling away from the lid margin as well. And so she was completely inspissated. These, these glands were, were blocked. Um, so go to the next slide. So this is what we did with her. Uh, I did Blefex. The way I explain it to patients is, look, you've got this, bacterial load and it's just like uh, when you you know it's a biofilm so what is a biofilm well you deal with a biofilm every day of your life the plaque on your teeth and you go to the, you think you're getting it off you brush multiple times a day you think you're getting it clean but when you go to the dentist you find out what clean really is and you realize hey you really weren't getting that off because it's tenacious it sticks on there like crazy glue and home scrubbing is not going to remove that biofilm Home scrubbing will help slow down its rebuild up, but it won't remove it. So we do, we'll do Blefex, and in this patient, I do I did IPL as well. We, typically, I like to do if I'm doing just IPL, it's a series of four treatments spaced two to four weeks apart. What I've started doing more recently is mixing up IPL with LLLT, and because they do different things, they're not. It's not well. Which one do you like better? IPL is just a phenomenal way of quelling inflammation. And from my own personal dry eye, it is what worked like a charm for me. But it's not a great method for heating and expressing glands. And I don't express after IPL because the glands aren't really heated and you're just trying to squeeze cold. And I don't like doing that. You can do damage. But LLLT, there's two different masks that we have. There's a third mask that I don't have. But the blue mask will help quell inflammation. It will fight any bacterial surface stuff and is supposed to work on rosacea. Yeah, I'm not so certain. I'm not 100% convinced of that effectivity. I, I know that IPL works great for against rosacea. But the red mask on LLLT generates heat within the gland. Unlike lipoflow, which is an external or an exogenous heat source trying to push heat into the gland, there's no heat coming off of this mask. It is just a light energy that gets absorbed by the gland structure. The goal of that is to really boot up the production of ATP in the, in the, uh, within the cells and rev up the cellular production of a higher quality layer of mybum, and that's its long-term effect. But short term, it generates a lot of heat within the gland, and I've been able to express glands better after using LLLT than with any other device I've ever used. 
I, I was big into tear care for a while until we decided to try the LLLT. So this particular patient, her OSDI was 25 after, uh, before we started, after her, her first visit, um, we brought her down to an OSDI of 12 after, and that was the LLLT. The second visit was uh, her second IPL, or actually that was her third visit, uh, and I brought her OSDI down to five, and that was today. So she's been here three times for three separate treatments, and her OSDI score has gone from 25 down to five. Uh, she has one more LLT dual mask treatment coming up uh, next week. Um, you can go on to the next slide. Tom, would you say that there's a direct correlation between the lowering of the OSDI score or speed score and the patient satisfaction with the treatments? Absolutely. I mean, these, you know, you, you can see these are very lucrative treatments, of course, but and that's nice. But the best part is these people that we used to dread seeing, you know, let's face it, dry eye patients you never made happy before. They're now among my happiest patients. And that's a total game changer. Uh, it's it's why after 34 years, I I love this stuff. I mean, it's I, it's it's made it fun again. Awesome. So here, here you can see. Yeah, this. No, I would say both of those surveys just quantify their happiness, right? It gives us a way to, you know, like, are you feeling better? Yes. Like, okay, that's kind of good to know. And, and I agree with Tom. These are happy people now, which makes life better. And the, the it's, it's a way to quantify it. Yeah. I, and, you know, there, we also, I didn't show it here, but we also will quantify by doing another, um, another screening on the keratograph and looking at the differences. We'll look at differences in the lipid layer. We'll look at differences in the breakup time. When you see someone's breakup time going from three and a half seconds to 21 seconds, uh, that's pretty substantial. Now, typically after uh, LLLT, I'll express, but not every patient likes it. And according to Stone Cipher, you don't have to. Um, my experience has been that patients are happy whether I express or not. I just think it happens faster when we express. And this is what this patient has, well, when we're all, when all is said and done, this is what she's going to do. This is what she's going to pay. So we bill a 99214. It's 124 and change here. Um, the dry eye evaluation with the uh, crystal tear report that is software that's based, baked into the keratograph is $99. That's an out-of-pocket expense. The heat mask is $80. The, the lid scrubs, the hypochlorous spray, I'm really big on those. I'm also really big on uh, DE3. We did a Blefex for treatment, two IPLs at $350 a treatment, and two LLLTs, dual mask. You can do, it, you can do a single mask, but this was a dual mask treatment. You can see the total is over $2,000. Um, and, and to be clear, the only thing you're billing to insurance is your office visit. That is correct. The rest is an out-of-pocket expense for the patient. Jim, I have your second patient up. So second patient came, an internal referral, um, interested in LASIK, you know, best corrects to good vision, doesn't report any medicines, you know, osmolary, a little bit off, speed, kind of, you know, it, higher than what you'd want but you know compared to some of my dry patients it seems low but that's what kind of flagged her to go take a look um when she was seen on the laser vision side they just did a quick look at her meibomian glands with the white light at the lamp and said eh, it looks like you've dropped out when we did my biography it was remarkable you know the significance of gland loss and just very little meibom um very inspissated glands um quick breakup time a lot of you know Partial blinks, inferior staining, um, no injection, no papillae, no buff, you know, like down next. Um, you know, kind of to Tom's point, it's like before I do any treatment, whether it be Lipiflow or Ilux, I'll always kind of degrade the 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 uh, the lids. And I've never not gotten a bunch of stuff on on whether you want to call it a golf club spud or a hockey spud, um, depending on part of the country. So we talked about blink exercises. We said, you know, let's get you on Hydroi and, and any heat mask. And you know, generally with that, if they're scheduled for laser vision correction, um, 
I want to see them before their their surgery date just to make sure things fine. So I think her surgery date was going to be out like three weeks. And she calls after a week because she was somewhat like, and as I explained this, she was upset she couldn't have surgery now, right? And then she was up, upset. that's like, well, how come, why do I have all this gland loss? And I more or less attributed it to the poor blinks. Um, I certainly, they can affect it. And she was otherwise healthy and, you know, young, fit, um, female. And so she calls in a week and she goes, um, could me taking medicine affect my eyes? It's like, Bill, what have you taken? How many or what? You know, it's like, it's it's the classic. And then, of course, they never say it. And she goes, well, I'm taking Accutane. Will that affect anything? It's like, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. It's like, um, yes. And so now, it, I mean, not blinking or having poor blinks, that's how I justified the my bony gland loss. And she'd been taking Accutane for... A number of years and so it explains the gland loss explains all of it and saved our butts from doing laser vision correction because you do lasik on her and it's a trainer and i am as big a fan of laser vision correction as anybody you know it's been the best part of my career with it and uh she'd have been awful yeah one of the tricky things about um accutane now it goes by about 13 different names so you got to be careful when patients tell you a drug you're not totally familiar with to make sure that it's not a, uh, right, right, right. Retinoic acids because it really has a profound effect. Even if they took it years ago for a short period of time, it can have a profound effect on meibomian glands. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, our washout period is a minimum of six months. So. Awesome case, Tom. Here's your second case. Sure. I'm just going to go back for one second, though, about that, because I, I, I looked for my second case. I wanted it to be a, it was a 22-year-old we have with almost zero meibomian gland structure left. And I'm, you know, how does that happen in a 22-year-old? And I, I asked her, and she's been using retinol creams on the eye since she was like 12 years old. Oh, and wow. Retin-A, retinol, I mean, it, it's. Wow. One of the other, yeah, all of the same. Yeah. Wow. Wow, yeah. So yeah, I, I, I guess there's no acne. Uh so this this is a seventy-eight year old white female, um gritty watery eyes, dryness, photophobia, again, sensitive to air movement. Her her exact phrase was eyes feel gunky. Her OSDI is 30, Nick butts are just over eight seconds. And again, she also has no visible oil layer. A little bit of debris in the tear film, and if you look carefully, um, you will see she's got mild ocular rosacea and just a trace of blepharitis. Again, you can look along that lash line, you can see that whitish discoloration just along the lash line. It's not real bad in her because there, there's really no accumulation around the lashes. Um, mild meibomian gland dis loss. The meibomian gland loss doesn't, you know, go back for a second, Bill, doesn't really match necessarily her OSDI of 30. But if you look at this, again, you can see you've got those dark stripes down the center, and you can see how dysmorphic these glands are. They are inspissated, and I guess you're getting back pressure that makes that happen, makes that, uh, that dysmorphic shape change. You can also see nasally that she's lost some gland structure there yeah so she's got some gland loss so what did we do with her next slide bill so she was one that we did tear care on um almost a year ago her osdi was 30 when i saw her back a month later it had dropped to six we just did a, a one month follow-up visit check her again Typically, I like to see them just like like Jim. At six months, she pushed it a little bit longer, so it was at nine months. And her OSDI was up to nine, but she was complaining about other symptoms and the wind bothering her. So at that point, we didn't uh, we we set her up for LLLT. And if I'm just doing LLLT, I uh, the dates are wrong here, but they're two to three days apart, and um, with each successive LLLT, and in this lady, I did not express her at all after after each um, 
each treatment, her OSDI score has improved, and by the time we finished, she ended up with an OSDI score of one. So to go back to what Jim said, you know, you asked them about when do you see these people back? Well, I see them back at six months, and typically I'm going to tell them, usually we're just going to end up looking at you in six months. We know at some point, this is a chronic condition, at some point we're going to have to address it again. But if they're doing well at six months, I may just let it ride for another six months. But if there's any question at all, if I'm seeing something in their keratograph that I don't like, I'll say, look, let's just give you a booster treatment and uh, we'll just plan on doing that once every six months. And it's not the whole series of treatments, it's a single treatment. I can tell you from my own personal experience with IPL that at six months, I thought, well, I should probably do my own IPL and and uh, see how I'm doing, but I feel pretty good. I don't really think I need it. And I had my tech do it on me, and I was really surprised at how much improved I was. Even though I was thinking I was okay, it did make an impact on me. So again, here, just, these are all the, the uh, procedures that we've done on her over the course of just under a year. And again, it's, you know, it's almost $2,000. Um, so, and of that, it was only the office visits that got billed to insurance, the rest is an out-of-pocket expense. And Tom, can you clarify too, on these patients, are you performing the uh, procedures, the RF, or the IPL, or the LLT, or is that done by your technician? Just to get an idea of what doctor time's involved. So, the LLT is done by my techs. I don't do that at all. Um, I, I will express some of those patients. You know, I find that patients don't like to be expressed. Um, I'm typically the one doing their blefx, and even though I didn't do blefx on this lady, I like doing blefx. We do a lot of it, and I typically will do that. I typically will do the IPLs. Um, even though I have two techs that have been certified in it, I've been a little hesitant to want to hand that over to them only because the potential consequences of using it improperly could be rather severe. Um, but tear care, techs do that. Um, LLT, the techs do that. And um, it, so it's made it easy uh, for me that I don't have to actually do a lot of the work. And unlike Jim, I don't do the keratograph. I, my techs are way better at it than I am. They do it all day, every day. So Jim, I think we've got one more patient. Time for one more patient. So if you want to tell us about your third patient. Sure, sure. This one's got a, a bunch of moving parts. Um, Six-year-old female, six months out of multifocal IOLs, not happy with her near vision or her far vision. You know, so obviously her cataract surgery didn't work. Her eyes feel red and tired, and she was put on restasis, and so that didn't help at all. And so, you know, the surgeon refers over to me going, help me with this. So, you know, as, as often is the case, the person who can't see, they see on a QD chart 2020, osmolarity is a little bit elevated, speed score kind of through the roof. Um, uh, not a significant gland loss, um, but when you look at her lids, and, you know, this is a picture from a company called Tarsus. A, a friend of mine, Aziz, got me this picture. I didn't have her pictures, but this is a classic example. If you look at someone with a slit lamp straight on, you kind of the lashes superiorly don't look all that bad. You have them look down and there's just collarettes everywhere. And boy, I felt like such an idiot as I now I look at people, have them look down and just go, huh, how long have I been missing all of this? Um, and so she also had a bunch of papillae, some injection, collarettes, inferior staining, quick breakup time. So she's got, you know, a whole host of things going on. Um, and you know, with her goal of let's make me vision clear. So we did a Blafex treatment with zocular foam. I've gone back and forth with the AccuSoft, their you know, Demodex treatment. Um, I'm also you know super excited about the company Tarsus when their their Demodex drops will come out. Hopefully that's you know sometime in the next maybe year or so. Put her on pad a day. Um, gave her the zocular wipes, tears, and let's see you back in a couple of a, a, a couple of a couple of weeks. So see her back in a couple of weeks. Of course, her main complaint: my vision still fluctuates. It's still all over the place. But now her eyes don't rich. Her eyes are less red. 
Um, Dishon's, you know, worst running in the day, speed score. Yeah, 18 numerically is better than 20, but that's just, you know, maybe I maybe I didn't even know how to add, right? Um, Papilla last, Injections last, Lids and Lashes looked a whole lot better, right? So it's like we've got problem one at least under control. So now let's look at what's causing this really short breakup time. What's, you know, it's in specific glands. So we do. Um, warm compress, hydro eye, continue with the wipes, continue pad a day, um, and, and get her set up for an ILUX treatment. And so this is a more of a typical how I'll walk into ILUX, so to speak, and that I want some sort of home treatment started. I want the hydro eye, I want them kind of getting a little bit more stable with those glands. So we see her back in a month. There's the next slide. Um, and vision's a little bit better but it's really poor on the computer. Um, no itching, speed score's gone down. So just on the hydro eye and the warm compresses, we're kind of moving the right direction. Um, I did not do osmolarity. Everything's looking better. Um, tear breakup time, still not great. Um, and you know, the glands don't look good. Treat her with Ilux and finally have her back on the next visit. Is the next visit the treatment? Um, we're finally to her main complaint, right? And that the vision's comfortable. And so what started as a, oh, these multifocal IOLs don't work. Um, they actually do work and they do work when they're done well, but they're very, very sensitive to macular problems and they're very, very sensitive to tear layer problems. And so in getting her tear layer back to normal, I um, mean, you see breakup time eight to 10, you know, we're 10 out of 15. You know, they're not perfect. You know, it's 50% clear, 50% cloudy, but her speed score is now at a seven, you know, no itching. So we know we need to maintain her lids and lashes and maintain her meibomian glands. But, you know, it took, you know, eight weeks to get to this point. Um, and I think a common mistake of this patient post-surgery, oh, let's put them on restasis. That'll fix your dry eye. It's like, in her case, you know, she had multiple problems and you could have maybe taken a whole shotgun approach and done a lot at once. I found I'm not confident of where Delmedex is gonna go after a treatment. I've had patients, I would say the majority of patients do really well and I've had patients who be a bit recalcitrant. And so I kind of take it step by step and go from there and then add on, you know, the, the meibomian gland treatment for her. So, gentlemen, thanks for sharing these actual live patients that you're treating today's in your practices. It's really amazing to see the results that can be achieved yeah, using technology and using the right diagnostic tools. Um, so I want to ask one question before we wrap up and, and maybe have time for one or two questions from the audience. Um, the potential annual income from dry disease, I think it's obvious from the slides we put, but um, Jim, why don't we start with you? Um, what kind of annual income do you think you're going to see um, now that you've been doing this soul dry eye practice for a while now? Um, quantify, I don't know. Um, I'm a little bit new in this exact setting. Um, it, it's I'm not here full time, but it's significant. I mean, I'm in a little bit different world. So I'll do two to three treatments a day. And so that's a fair amount of money each day. And, you know, I think Tom did a real nice job of like, we sell the masks, we sell the hypochlorous acid, we sell, you know, all those things kind of add up. And the, the in our world, we call them nutraceuticals. And I kept trying to say that to patients, they kept looking at me funny. So now I say the vitamins you're going to take for your eyes and they understand vitamins. And so when you sell the vitamins, um, that's ongoing, right? And it becomes a little bit of annuity. Um, so I think it's 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 very meaningful. Um, and I think what's turned the corner is we have treatments that can solve problems and now these patients are happy. So if you're just kind of like kicking the can down the road and kicking the can down the road, that wears on you day to day, but I've got patients that are just thrilled. And so it's 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 rewarding to do and you make make a reasonable amount of money with it. I think that's really important. I mean it Tom, go ahead. No, I, 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 when I, I came to visit your practice, I was very impressed on how in a very short period of time you established a real significant 
dry practice within your contact lens specialty practice. Can you uh, sum up for us a little bit about the potential in impact of the income to your practice? Sure. I'm just going to touch on what Jim just said, though. It's, it's those happy patients. You're doing things for people that no one, no one has ever been able to do or show them. I had a lady today. She said, I've been going to a great doctor for the past 20 years. He's never showed me anything like this. He's been handing me bottles of artificial tears for years. So getting those, those patients and making them happy is the big game changer. Now, the income, I, because it, this is a primary care practice and it is my, you know, I, I, it's not a huge facility, it's, it's my office. I know exactly what the income is. We got serious with the dry eye almost exactly two years ago. Really started in dry eye, with dry eye in earnest in November of 2019. And within two and a half months, we were able to pay off the keratograph. Um, then COVID hit. And uh, so the rest of 2020, we still did well. But in the first six months of this year, we've done over $200,000 in dry eye alone. And at the rate we're going, the dry eye program is still growing. At the rate we're going, we're going to probably end up the year around $425,000 in, in dry eye. Now, understand that this is not managed care for the most part. This is fee for service. Something old guys like, like me and Jim, uh, we, we remember those terms. And um, it's very fondly because these are non-covered services. So the, the ROI is around 80%. And the, the financial impact for my practice has just been huge. For me personally, has been huge. And um, I, it's how I probably spend, it enabled me to go out and hire an associate. I was a solo practitioner for 30, two uh, years of my my practice. It's only in the last, not quite two years that I have an associate. She does all the primary care anymore. I don't really love glaucoma. She does all the glaucoma. Um, I'm spending probably 70% of my day seeing dry eye patients for either evaluations or treatments. Uh, I don't do very many comprehensive exams anymore. The rest of my time is spent on specialty lenses, scleroles. Uh, ortho K and myopia control. After all these years in, in practice, these are the things that I enjoy doing and the things that I don't enjoy, I, I delegate. Um, so it's getting to be fun. I mean, I, instead of retiring, I'm, I'm ramping it up. I, you know, we, the dry eye stuff, especially IPL and now the radio frequency has taken us out of strictly dry eye and putting us into the realm of aesthetics. And um, so we're gonna be opening up an aesthetic center. We're in the process of, of get that planning right now. Um, and that is you know, completely free of medical insurance. Those, that is totally uh, an out-of-pocket expense for patients. It'll be a separate business. It won't be part of my practice. My practice is gonna stay in my practice, but um, you know, IPL gets into aesthetics because it treats rosacea and skin discolorations, age spots, freckles. Uh, we've been treating that. We've been doing not just dry eye treatments, but some aesthetic treatments uh, in the areas around the eye. And uh, adding the radio frequency, radio frequency doesn't do anything for skin tone, but it does stimulate collagen and elastin production and will help with fine wrinkles and bags under the eyes. And actually, although I don't know this personally yet because I haven't really done it long enough, uh, I am told it will tighten up loose lids and uh, maybe improve some function. So uh, I'm excited to see that. That's, that, that's to, be, to be seen, to be determined. Next, the next phase in Tom's career. Yeah. So, so, gentlemen, we, we don't have much time left, but uh, a lot of great information here. I'm going to ask one question that we got from the audience that I think could benefit from a little bit of um, clarification. This one is directed at you, Tom, and that's when you have a dry eye patient, and depending on the type of dry eye, how do you determine whether you'll do an IPL 
versus a radio frequency versus an LLT. And I, we saw in one patient example, you actually use a combination of both, but I know there's skin types and there various different factors, but as far as the dry eye goes, how do you determine which you think will be the best for that patient's um, condition? So it dep depends on whether their primary condition is in inflammation, inflammation-based, or is it really just obstructed glands? Or some, some patients, you may just, you'll, get, you'll be able to express them and you'll get some cloudy mybum coming out, but it'll still be liquid. And those patients, perhaps just an LLT alone is going to be enough. But the real one-two punch is quell the inflammation, clean out the glands and get them flowing again. And that would be the combination therapy. And I don't care what your heating and expression method is. Um, it, it, in, to my mind, there's no procedure that quells inflammation better than IPL. Um, and these days I'm really liking, as I said, the LLLT for heating and expression. The radio frequency, I don't have enough experience with to answer that question just yet. Um, like I said, the only ones I've used that on so far are myself and my staff. Um, but Excellent. yeah, it, it really depends on the presentation. If there's rosacea, it's usually going to be LLLT. I'm sorry, um, IPL. Yeah. But and I obviously, would, if, it's a, if it's a dark skin patient, you're probably going to avoid IPL also. That is correct. We'll we'll avoid it for based on skin tone. We'll avoid it based on sun exposure. So I, I'm in Myrtle Beach. And a lot of my, my patients are, as I said, are mostly retirees. They're all on the golf course all day long, and they're all tan as could be. Uh, and if they're not on the golf course, they're out playing, you know, they're out at the beach. So those are patients that in the summer, I don't do as much IPL. I'll do more LLT in the summer. And uh, my IPL numbers will ramp up again uh, in the fall and, and the winter. And Jim, final thought on a similar issue. When you do thermal expression or, or before you do thermal expression, do you do anything to um, clean off? The, do you do Blefex or, or something similar? Or you do a manual scrape? Or what, what's your procedure? I will always do a minimal or manual scrape. So uh -huh. sometimes we'll do Blefex. And I kind of, Tom's, you know, great observations, like that little bit of kind of white whatever. I've never not scraped and kind of had a meaningful amount of gunk that I think is a perfect medical term for it um, there. And I know kind of from the FDA studies with, with either of the procedures that was not allowed to have happen and they got good results. And so I know results, once you remove that and kind of open up some of the, the glands a little bit, um, there's a there's actually a company out of Australia that's coming up with a drop that removes keratization. And their, their phase two study showed improved by Bellman gland expression by just removing keratization. And his theory is the keratization is the start of the problem, not, you know, blinking or inflammation. So my guess is things can be more than single causation, but having a drop to help remove the keratization and something to heat treat, um, I think we've got some exciting things coming. Jim, and I want to thank you both tonight for all this incredible information. Tom, I just did the math and I think I need to do 45 vision care exams tomorrow for, my, for a vision plan to equal one of your dry patients. So um, I think I have a long day ahead of me tomorrow, but I wanna thank both of you for, again, giving us this great information on dry eye. And if there are any additional questions, please send them in and we'll be happy to answer them via uh, email. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Thanks Tom. Have a nice evening.